So I'm here to talk with you about circumcision. I'm calling it the elephant in the hospital because it's this, it's this huge thing that happens as far as I see it in our culture, but we have very little discourse about it. It's performed between 500,000 and a million times each year in the U.S., uh, almost entirely on infants within the first three days of life. It's completely unnecessary and, I believe, based on my research, entirely harmful to children. Green countries are places where genital cutting of boys is not practiced. Circumcision is now rare in Canada, England, and Australia, where it used to be practiced on babies also, but stopped in the 1950s after an article was published showing that it killed a number of children each year. Now, how did we get here? Right? So it's become a medical practice, and that came about in the late 1800s when people had not the germ theory of disease, but the nervous excitation theory of disease. You can find a lot of published medical literature showing that circumcision cured things like paralysis and epilepsy and hip joint disease and all sorts of problems that have no, that today seem very unlikely for the (laughs) the process to have cured. The intention was to harm the genitals of children and they thought that that would help them in the long term because it would prevent them from having so much sexual excitation. That in the Victorian model being the most dangerous kind of nervous excitation you could have. It's oftentimes talked about from the parents' perspective. You know, oh, parents have a right to choose. I want you to question that discourse and think about what's the child's point of view? Who owns the child's body? What rights do they have? Why are we doing it to boys and not girls? What's that say about our view of gender? This is a circumcision restraint. They strap the baby down to it, and then they proceed with the procedure, which I'm going to show you a short video of. Beyond the pain of the procedure itself and the pain of the many days it takes to heal, there are a number of complications that a circumcision procedure puts a child at risk for. You can sort of divide them into two categories. Surgical complications, which go from the more minor, you know, everyone has a scar who's been circumcised. A lot of men don't actually know that the ring around their penis is the circumcision scar, or they learn it when they hear my talk. Penal adhesions, when the healing process goes awry in two parts of the penis that weren't supposed to be connected, linked together. At the top left, A, that's called a fistula. The black line going down is a probe that's entering the meatus, the opening of the urethra, and exiting out the additional hole that the physician has caused. B is a nearly amputated head of the penis. C, so much skin of the penis was removed that the child's corpus cavernosa and head of the penis are lodged down inside the scrotum. And D, the penis was accidentally amputated entirely. There are also a number of post-operative complications, ranging from difficulty breastfeeding, bleeding, which is another sort of minimizing term. You see that on consent forms, and you're like, oh, bleeding. Well, it turns out an infant has 12 ounces of blood, so bleeding a couple ounces may actually cause that child to die or need a blood transfusion. Increase in pain response, infection, which is also very serious for a newborn, Uh, meatitis, which is an irritation of the opening, and that also can be problematic because if it gets bad enough, the child won't be able to pee. Necrosis and even permanent loss of the penis or death. Pediatric urologist, those are the people who get the complications to deal with. And he said in a two-year period, he had over 275 kids he had to treat, almost half of whom required surgery. So they were subjected to an additional surgery in order to attempt to correct whatever had happened. So what is the foreskin? The foreskin is this socially constructed thing. It's really just a part of the penis. But since we cut it off, now we need to give it a separate name. In fact, a lot of a lot of potential complications lists that you get on your informed consent form say that one of, the, one of the risks is that you might injure the penis. So we've actually constructed a reality or a view of reality in which cutting off part of the penis is not injuring it. It's only if you then cut the part that you had intended to leave that it's an injury. The foreskin in an adult male is the part that would have been removed. is about 12 to 15 square inches. It's the size of a 3 by 5 index card. It is the most erogenous part of a human male. It contains 10 to 20,000 fine touch nerve endings, and it also makes the penis shaft skin motile. So it's the difference when, you know, when you're having intercourse or some kind of sexual interaction, it's the difference between this kind of interaction and something like if you can imagine a part of your body where the skin moves around nicely. And that's actually a significant thing because there's another kind of nerve called a stretch receptor that gets stimulated during that motion, and it's the male's contribution to mechanical lubrication during intercourse. The most sensitive regions are that sort of maroon color, and the second most sensitive regions are the the purplish color. If we compare that 
to a circumcised penis, what you see is we removed, we've removed most of the most sensitive areas and left just this region around the scar and the remainder of the frenulum is really where most men who are sensitive. Drawn these lines so that you can see how much tissue it is as it retracts. And the other difference I want you to note is that the, in, the inside, what it does is it, it generally surrounds the penis. So it, in a sense, it invaginates it. It gives it a, a closure, and that keeps it moist. So if you compare that with the circumcised penis, there's a lot, the tissue looks softer, moister, and warmer, in addition to there being a lot more of it. And it doesn't have the scar. Those arrows there are pointing to the scar. Doing all this work that I do with parents, I've talked with many, who when they receive their child back, that's the moment at which they understand what they had signed up for. And so there's a, there's a problem with informed consent, both that the information is lacking and that parents are sometimes asked about it at an inconvenient moment. And they're also asked about it in this sort of values-neutral way. It's like, you know, would you like a pillow? Would you like a, a cup of tea? Would you like your child circumcised? You know, it carries the same sort of tone. You know, <laughs> parents need to trust physicians. They're the people who are, the physicians are supposedly the ones who are bringing in the discipline of medicine. And they, so they come in, but they're given this information that is very cursory. It lacks uh, real information about the complications. Those are trivialized. The foreskin functions are completely omitted. It's not mentioned that it's actually a sexual organ. And the ethical questions of making decisions about your children's bodies are omitted. And there's also this undeclared conflict of interest. There is there's really a lot of commercial use of the tissue. We use it for three things right, uh, that I've been able to find. We use it for research. So there's a large, there are a large number of products you can buy from Invitrogen, which is actually a company I buy other things that don't contain foreskin cells from, uh, for my, my biophysics research. And you can buy, so there are some of the product codes. You can go look it up yourself. They really sell things taken from neonatal foreskins. Well, at a hospital, you can get magic skin treatment, which is grown up foreskin tissue. And if you're very wealthy, you can buy cosmetics. The other thing parents don't know is that it's, it's painful for a week or longer afterwards. So the baby's not only in pain during the process, but this wound has to heal. It's a wound on the penis, and babies are very sensitive to pain. And now this new parent who's dealing with the healing process, the process of like figuring out what it's like to have this new baby, also has this added complication. They have to watch for, watch for signs of infection. They have to keep changing the bandage, and their baby's more upset. Than, than he would have been. In comparison, if the child's not circumcised, all you have to do is, well, almost nothing. In fact, you don't even wash the penis. Just like you wouldn't wash your baby's vagina with soap, you just rinse it. You don't retract it. You don't, uh, it becomes retractile on its own. And you have a baby with fewer health problems and who is more content. And if the idea of you know, doing things to our children because we want them to look a certain way chills you, I'm glad. I want it to chill us. I want us to wonder why are we so busy making our children look like what we think boys and girls should look like? In this case, we have this idea boys should, should look a certain way in their genitals. First, we start by pathologizing a healthy organ. Not only are, is the foreskin absent from most U.S. medical and anatomy texts, there's, no, there's therefore no education about the functions. It's not spoken of as a sexually important organ. Physicians are only taught how to remove it as a procedure, and they're mistaught care. They're mistaught this retract and wash philosophy, which is problematic because the foreskin, when you're born, is usually attached to the head of the penis. What you, what you saw early in the circumcision video was the physician running this tool around to scrape the foreskin loose so they could cut it off. It's bonded like that to protect babies from, well, all the sorts of things that babies do. You know, they might, get, they might have feces or urine in their diaper. They might get scratched up. So the foreskin has this protective function when you're young. Gradually, that detaches, and the, the foreskin becomes retractile. But if you forcibly retract it, that tears it up and creates a site for infection. Also, if you wash with soap, that creates a site for infection. And finally, we make this, this misdiagnosis called phimosis. There's a true problem called phimosis, which is when there's scar tissue at the opening of the foreskin, so it can't retract. And there are treatments for it using steroidal cream to help the scar tissue soften. But when we think that a baby who's three weeks old has phimosis because you can't pull the foreskin back without making the baby scream, that's wrong. It's actually meant to be attached that way. It grew that way, and it will become retractile on its own. Most of the people I talk to think it's not their responsibility to do anything about it, including professional organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the practitioners, you know, because their job is to 
keep practitioners looking good. So if you go against some, you say that something's bad that your practitioners are doing, that doesn't look so good. The ethics committee at the hospital told me that they're not the appropriate venue for this concern. I think all of these organizations are neglecting parents, children, and us. I'm hopeful that I've engaged you with some interest and that maybe you'll go and tell people about this because if they're not going to take responsibility, I hope that we will. So tell your friends.